Hello everybody and welcome back to another review. I'm of course Captain Sidaris and joining me from one time zone away is Owen. Hi there. Hello Cap, thanks for having me along again. Oh, always. Since I always enjoy your company and we already had a face-to-face -face conversation on your channel. I think it's just fitting that we are meeting here again. <laughs> Lovely. But you're not the only one from a different time zone here. Joining us very far away is also Easy Street, the developer of the amazing Elite Force mod for SWAT 4. Hi there. Hello. How are you doing? How is life in the States? It's been interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that much. <laughs> Sadly, that's always true in current days, but we are here to talk about an amazing title. Before we go into the title, I would like to know a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What do you in real life? How did you get into the game? Well, my experience with SWAT 4 goes back to probably a time when I was too young to be playing that kind of a video game. I was playing it in uh, sixth grade. I think my dad introduced it to me and we played a little bit of co-op together and he actually installed it on my computer that I took home to my mom's house. And I would be up until probably like three or four in the morning playing co-op on the Frosty's Playhouse server. It was it was bad. I, I played too much of it. And I, I was actually interested in modding it back then at that time, not as a programmer, but as a more level designer type of person. Like I, I looked up the tutorials and stuff online about how to make levels. And I was like, yeah, you know, what would be really cool is if I made a mod that was centered around Miami because, you know, a very different aesthetic from New York. It says Fairview, but come on, guys, it's it's New York City. You can't beat around the bush with that one. But I thought, hey, like, let's do a Miami setting. That would be really cool, especially if you consider like CSI, for example, they did a New York after doing a Las Vegas one and a Miami one makes a lot of sense. Uh, it just wasn't really in the cards as it turns out, I'm not terribly artistically talented. I've made peace with that. I instead, through the process of developing other mods and in the process of developing actually some Flash games, I learned that I have more of a proclivity for programming. And it wasn't until actually much later that I started doing any kind of development on SWAT 4. And part of that is because SWAT 4 doesn't have a lot of resources on it. There's an SDK that was released for SWAT 4, but unless you knew that it was released, you couldn't exactly find it. Uh, it wasn't until I, I actually found it and put it up on ModDB that it was very publicly widespread available. There were some forums here and there, some CD sites that you can download it off of. The, even more complicated than that is that there's the original game's software development kit SDK and then there's the expansion set which is its own SDK with its own code and another level of complication of that is that my background being in more developing mods for at the time for Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy which I also I, I can talk briefly about that later part of another complication with developing the game is that it's an unreal script which again, there's not a lot of resources out there. There's the Beyond Unreal Wiki, which describes it in kind of vague details, but that's about it. Like, and even then Beyond Unreal is not around anymore. It's very much like a site that goes down frequently here and there. It's, it's spotty in terms of how well it's around. Um, yeah, I mean, I played it in like the eighth grade and then I just kind of got sucked into other games and I started working on those. And yeah, even like I developed flash games for a period of time and I sold like, maybe it's embarrassing. I, I maybe made like $10 off of it. Well, that's fantastic. Early in my career, I always wanted to be a designer and an animator. Um, so I got into flash and it was from flash. I learned to program for action scripts. And then I found out that I very similarly have more of a proclivity for development than for design. So I'm still, I still do a little bit of both, but I really appreciate your perspective there because, yeah, I, I followed almost entirely the same path from a different direction. Oh, yes. I definitely started out as an ideas guy for sure. Like, hey, I have this really cool idea. And then I didn't want to see it through because actually it turns out developing stuff is pretty hard. I mean, 
even looking at the time that I spent developing Elite Force and putting it together, it was probably like two to three years to just get all of the baseline features of it out. And I wouldn't necessarily call it a huge mod. It's more like an enhancement or maybe a second expansion pack for the game. I wouldn't call it a total conversion at all. I also wonder, are you doing this as a profession? Are you a professional coder or do something completely else? So like when I started out with Elite Force, I was actually going to college for computer science. And the reason why I chose computer science is not because I wanted to be a software developer, but because I wanted specifically to be a game developer. While I was in college, I was actually my parents that were like, you know, you probably shouldn't pigeonhole yourself into games too much. You should look at software development because if you have trouble with the games industry, then you have something to fall back on. And well, ironically, that kind of came out to be true because even though I had a lot of interaction with game developers, um, actually probably about the same time that I started on Elite Force, I was given an opportunity to do QA for Raven Software out of um, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, which turned out to be a bit of a blessing in disguise that they hired somebody else because if you're familiar with what's been going on at Raven Software, they haven't been treating their QA team very well. And they actually, I think, struck, they, they did a strike a couple of years ago. But also at the same time, like as I was winding out of college, I had off of the heels of the success of Elite Force, I had a brief stint where I worked with the team behind Ready or Not. I would say about two years I worked with them developing something that is essentially kind of a spiritual successor to SWAT 4. But nowadays, I don't actually do a whole lot of game development stuff. I... I'm actually a research and development type of person. I do some software development, but it's within the context of like develop an application that uses this really experimental hardware and software setup and do something that'll be really awesome for our customers. Which like doing stuff with Elite Force is kind of interesting because 90% of the challenge I would say is figuring out how any of this stuff works. Like there isn't a guide out there that's like, well, here's how you add this feature to the game. It's more like, here's this feature of Unreal Script that like, here's a couple of quirks about it. You got to figure out the rest of how these quirks work and put it together yourself. And I think that really set me up nicely for where my career is at actually now. But like I said, I don't, I don't do a lot of game stuff anymore. I did probably within the last year or two i actually did some contract work for something that's currently under nda right now but again very independent i would say probably my work with ready or not was the closest that i had to like triple a game development if you want to call it that i don't know that i would call void interactive triple a definitely like triple a quality for sure but like we were a team of maybe 20 people at one point putting this thing together and i was only like the other programmer from everything i've heard recently i don't think the triple a space is a great place to be working anyway yeah <laughs> oh yeah it's pretty awful yeah, yeah. I, and i'm fairly lucky that in terms of where i'm at with the tech space right now i've been mostly in defense so like broader tech space has had a lot of job layoffs and stuff like that and 2023 has been like a really great game for players you know like there's been a lot of really great games that have come out this year but it's just been absolutely brutal in terms of the job market well i would say we should also talk about the subject which brings us all together what is what for it is a tactical first person shooter from the year 2005 as the name suggested, play as a member of SWAT in a very atypical shooter. Like in real life, the game rewards following proper police procedures. So, sadly, you don't kill all the bad guys on site. You have to ensure the safety of the civilians and the criminals. So, yeah, sorry there. But at least you can do that in 
the original game at least in 13 unconnected missions and the for me better game experience the expansion added it a lot more especially on the quality of life improvements and yeah i can really gladly say that you can play this game without any problems any big problems on modern operating systems your players maybe should know that widescreen support is there but you have to either set it manual in the config files or use a special mod like many games also the game lost its official multiplayer support in 2014 when GameSpy shut down but yeah there is this amazing feature called direct ip and lan mode which you don't even need for that game because the community is so great and created their own master servers long ago but maybe easy street you can tell us a little bit about the community i did a lot of research but it's a little bit hidden there are some discords a little bit scattered so can it tell us a little bit more there yeah i would say definitely the community has always been scattered and kind of all over the place there hasn't been like a single designated forum or like single hub that players or modders for that matter have gravitated towards and it's really unfortunate because you go into the game lobby the the server browser and there's all of these different servers, but that's kind of essentially what the community is. It's very, um, I, I don't want to say disorganized, but it's not, it's, you know, if you think, of, if you want to think about it, like in terms of historical, like figures, the way that I would describe it is like clans in Scotland or like Mongol tribes, like everybody is everybody's doing the same thing everybody's playing this game everybody is enjoying it but like there's not one spot that everybody gathers and says like well we really need to do this or like even just in terms of direction it's very interesting to me especially from the other games that i had played and experienced with like diablo 2 for instance there's like the amazon basin and like the frozen keep and like all of these very built up communities of different players like swap four is very much like it's always been just very much different clans and their servers and what they're running and have played this game since probably when it started and you'll still run into people occasionally that you've known since that period of time just because people come back to it and it's always a very fun game to play and very interesting game to show other people it's very unique you can't put specific label on it like you can other games it's not just like this is a you know another game where you shoot everybody it's not like a battlefield game where it's going to get like supplanted by the next battlefield game or the next call of duty game or you know there's very much a staying power here because there's not another game like it ready or not i would say is probably the closest thing to it but even then like there's still a lot of holdouts that still want to play swat 4 and in terms of the history i would say like there was an initial like big boom of players when the game came out and it's you know it's been kind of steadily trickling downwards you know because it's getting older less people are aware of it people are moving on getting their own lives but probably I would say the next big boom is like, and again, I don't want to sound ego egocentric here or egotistical here, but probably the next big boom is when the Elite Force mod came out and all of a sudden, like, we had a Discord server that was dedicated to SWAT4 co-op and, like, everybody wanted to join the server and connect with other people. Suddenly you had server counts that were, like, maybe two or three servers that had five six seven people in them suddenly you had five or six servers that were completely full of people and people were playing this mod and like really tuning into like all of the features and stuff that were being developed and it's kind of started like a second renaissance of mod development because when the game originally came out like there was a first wave of mods that were like the Canadian Forces Direct Action mod, for instance, or like SSF or SAS mod, those were like the first wave and like those were exciting for a period of time and just you gradually saw less and less mods. But then all of a sudden Elite Force drops and now we're we now we saw like 
essentially a second wave of mods come in. Like, for example, the um, first responders mod, there's Back to LA, for example, and those mods are actually based on Elite Force, in part because I, I wanted to keep the modding community going again. I, I made it open source so that people would want to use it as a base for their own mod projects. Um, yeah, and I would say things are, are back to dwindling again, just because like first responders, for example, like that kind of continued where Elite Force, like continued the momentum of where Elite Force was for a little while, but the mod developer actually like left for a period of time because I think there was like some toxic community stuff going on and he just kind of disappeared for a little while. But recently I heard he's actually back. So I, I guess we'll see what will happen with that. But I would say like the thing that keeps the community together is that everybody is like focused on the gameplay. Like there's some people that will Rambo and mess around and like try to ruin the fun for you. And when I say Rambo here, that's a term that's used within the co-op community for people that will just go off and start shooting everybody like Rambo. But in general, everybody wants to be like super tactical and super focused on getting the highest score possible. And that's kind of the been the filtering factor is that the people who are remaining in the community after all of these years are the people that are like, let's do it right and do it practiced and get really skilled at it. Like almost kind of like an esport, but not really because there's not a competitive aspect to it. Yeah. So you're going to whittle down to the hardcore players at this point. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That must Which have isn't... been so. Oh, sorry, Capcom. <laughs> Which isn't a bad thing. I just wanted to say. Oh, not at all. Um, that that must have been so rewarding to have to see your work being the thing that reignites the flame within the community. I can't imagine getting that kind of positive feedback and um, engagement from other players, other users, other developers is always a thing that um, sort of lights a fire under me. So uh, how was that? How did it feel personally? Well, to be honest about it, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, like you said, it's a rush. It's a very good feeling to have a lot of people suddenly like hey everybody wants to private private message you for a podcast interview right like everybody wants to to talk to you and everybody like is interested in what you have to say but on the other hand of it like i've seen other mod projects and i don't want to call out anybody in particular but there have been some other pro mod projects that i've seen where people let that sort of leader status i guess if you want to call it that the big mod in town like people have let that go to their heads and have been like well i'm the mod author that made this big mod so i know everything and you guys don't know everything which is not true like you you don't know more than the people who've been playing your mod non-stop know and just in general i don't want to carry an air of like superiority about myself about anything i just it gives me an ick factor but and I realized that me saying that, like, it's, you know, it's a complex thing. Like me saying that sort of also gives that sort of ick factor for myself. So it's been a challenging thing to, to grapple with, honestly. Like when I was working with Ready or Not Later, which is a spiritual successor to SWAT 4, like they were very much like aware of the fact that people had flocked to me and trusted the words that I had said and like... I was an authority on SWAT 4 for a period of time, even more than, honestly, I feel like there are more people besides myself that have been playing for longer and know the game more than I do, especially when it comes to the competitive modes. Because for our audiences here, SWAT 4 is not just a co-op game. It also has a player versus player modes in it, though those aren't as played, but there are people who I think definitely have more experience with the game, like TCR, for example. He's played it probably more than I have, especially in the competitive modes. But, like, you know, they were very much like, I don't want to say using me, but like, I was their authority. I was their in, their marketing person for SWAT 4. Like, it was a almost kind of like a tagline of the game like hey we're such a spiritual successor for SWAT 4 that we've got this mod author that made this really big mod for SWAT 4 on it so like that gives us like some credibility here like to be that sort of like 
to almost be like a marketing thing was kind of, you know, it was interesting. I mean, the literal definition of a poster child, really. Yeah, very much so. And like I said, I, I have a very complex relationship with ego and not letting things go to my head. And I've, I've had to grapple with it a little bit. I think that awareness of humility is commendable. So congratulations, honestly. I, I think genuinely more people should keep that in mind. Thank you for that. <laughs> no worries. One thing I hope you can help me, I couldn't sadly find many facts about the development history of the game. Maybe you can share a little bit. What I found is, of course, that the game was nearly two years in development. Irrational Games was the development studio behind it. Published was it, of course, by Sarah Entertainment, later known as Vivendi Universal Games in April of 2005. They created a custom-built Unreal 2 engine called Vengeance Engine. But sadly, that's it. Do you know maybe more? Yeah, so I've, I've done a little bit of research on this as well. And I've actually spoken with some of the developers through email. So it's a bit of a complex history that needs some context behind it. So, originally, the first three games in the SWAT series were developed by Sierra Entertainment. And following some kind of restructuring slash sketchy behavior on Sierra Entertainment's part, and just general business tomfoolery, they had much less development resources to do anything. So... Vivendi bought them out, I believe, before SWAT 4 came out. And one of the studios under their wing was Irrational Games. Now, Irrational Games, at this point in time, didn't have as large of a profile as they would after SWAT 4, for reasons that I will discuss. But they had developed, um, I think at this point, they developed Tribes and maybe one other game. I, I haven't played any of their other games. The game development cycle was actually surprisingly pretty short and very quick, in part because they were also at the time working on the seeds of a different project. So this project initially was a zombie co-op shooter, kind of in the vein of Left 4 Dead. And there's actually videos of it on YouTube. I think it's called District 9, if I'm not mistaken. So this District 9 game actually has a lot of DNA that's shared in common with SWAT 4. For example, you can issue commands through the same graphical user interface. There's the same shotgun even. Like, they put together a vertical slice gameplay demo of this thing. And what I'm not 100% sure of is, like, at what point they did that. If it was after SWAT 4 or if it was during the development of SWAT 4, because... Also at this time, they were co-developing Bioshock, which everybody and their grandmother has probably heard of Bioshock by now. It's what put Irrational on the map. And like Bio-what? Okay. Bioshock, man. No, I've never heard of it, no. <laughs> yeah, they, they actually used the same AI system that was in Tribes. It's called Tyrion, Tyrion AI. They used the same AI system from Tribes that they used in SWAT 4, that they used in Bioshock. It's the same same Vengeance engine, actually, if you can believe that. They just updated the graphics for it. So, like, SWAT 4 had a very quick to market development time, and they, you know, they did a fair bit of research on it. They went to a firing range and actually fired some weapons to get a feel for the recoil of it. They consulted with some SWAT officers to get a real good idea I think it was the NYPD, if I'm not mistaken, that they did some consulting with to see, like, you know, to get a real feel for what it's like. Yeah, I found some information. Uh, they had a retired LA SWAT officer, Ken Thatcher, as a consultant, he influenced many small details, nothing too big. But one thing especially bothered him was the gun behavior the player has. For example, he didn't like that the player is always aiming the gun up, especially on the, the, the fellow officers. This is nothing a real officer would ever do. And yeah, they used a lot of his knowledge and improved the game a lot by that. Yes, that's right. You're, you're correct. It was the LAPD. You're right. But this was, I don't want to say it was a rushed game because it's not, 
it wasn't rushed, right? It took a couple of years and they had a very structured game design document from what I could tell anyway. Like it was just not, I could tell just from their interviews of Bioshock and the, the supplemental stuff was that their heart was really, really into Bioshock while they were developing this game. And it's why I think for that reason that they actually passed off development of the expansion pack to another studio. And that is also obvious if you look at the expansion sets files and look at like little details, like the direction that they gave their voice actors is a little bit not quite the same and it doesn't quite fit perfectly. And their code base has different comments from different people. They did a really great job, but I, I definitely feel like if they put a little bit more into it, it would have been like something amazing and spectacular. And that's probably reflected in the review scores, honestly, for this game. Like, it didn't do terribly bad, like it got an 85, but it could easily have been a 90, especially considering like the caliber of Irrational Games' ability to put together an environment and like Bioshock, for example, is just amazing. And then SWAT 4, which came out like, I want to say two or three years before Bioshock is just like, not as much love there, but they, they could have been something truly amazing there, I feel like. Do you maybe know if they used anything from SWAT 3 or even had an original developer from that era? I don't honestly know if they used anything from SWAT 3's development. I can tell that they played SWAT 3. Like, some of the, for example, they use the term procedures and they use uh, leadership, like words that are like called out in SWAT 3's core DNA are there, but they're not exactly like forward facing. So they might have taken SWAT 3 and like did that as the bare bones of the game at first initially and then reworked it, especially considering like they still have the classic command interface from the original game, right? But it's clear to me, especially in the short amount of time that they developed the game, that they came in with a plan and executed the plan. I could be completely off base here, by the way. I haven't spoken to the developers in a very long time, and it was only like one or two email exchanges between them. Well, at least you had contact. This is very rare that you can even get in touch with the developers of a game. Oh yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I've not only for this game but also for um for other games. I've I you know, I've actually been given a copy of another game's uh, script before from the developers just by emailing them. Oh, that's <laughs> Yeah, it's not unbelievable but amazing. An honor, I would say. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I I don't want to name any names or games here, but like it was cuz I, I don't want to I think they're still working at that company, but just building a relationship with game developers like who have worked on games that you care about is like, it's it's fascinating to me. Yeah, I think it's also really worth archiving this stuff. It's so sad that you can't really get in touch with them, but they present or have such an amazing story in, in the development of our favorite games and it's sadly lost in time definitely yeah and i think part of that is reflected in the gog release of um swap 4 i think that the swap 4 source code unfortunately has been lost if i'm not mistaken i could be again completely wrong here but just judging from the fact that good old games gog there's some changes that they probably could have made to the game to improve it but I, again my memory here is a little bit hazy but i kind of got the impression from talking to the gog reps that they didn't have the source code for swat 4 which is unfortunate yeah i think it's rare that they get the source code it's an unbelievable achievement from them that they even give us so many classic titles for windows 10 11 yeah, for sure. And also that brings up another point also is that around the time that Elite Force dropped, probably about a year or so after it dropped was when we got the GOG release of the game. And prior to that, like there wasn't any way that you could 
actually find the game without like buying it on eBay or pirating it. So like it coming out on GOG was like another improvement to the momentum of the game. So, hey, maybe it wasn't me the whole time that brought that second wind. I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't do that to yourself. I'm sure it was. <laughs> it was definitely the combination. Yeah, I mean, after they released it on GOG, they actually did like a spotlight on the mod, I think. So that was really cool of them. I'm glad that they are in touch with their community and stuff like that, that they're aware of what's going on. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I was going to say, I'm sure that you, um, your influence and uh, the influence of the modding community in general probably guided that decision by GOG. I mean, um, they they obviously have a decision to make when they choose what games to release. And obviously they've got, I know, an entire forum of people making suggestions. So they don't just pick it, pick things that willy nilly. They pick things that are popular, that have momentum, they think are going to draw attention. So helping to keep a community alive, I'm sure, um, pushed that decision forward. Definitely, yeah. And another aspect of it as well is the licensing of these games. So like when SWAT 4 came out, Irrational Games, like the it's a weird licensing mess because the license to SWAT 4 wasn't owned by Irrational Games. It was owned by Sierra, but as we all know, Sierra dissolved and ceased to exist as a company. Their assets, as I understand it, were bought by Activision and Outside of releasing like a couple of King's Quest games, Activision has kind of largely sat on their IP and not done anything with it. So we don't, you know, we haven't heard of a SWAT 5. I don't even think we've had another Police Quest game, which SWAT is based off of, is a spinoff actually of the Police Quest games. But now, of course, Activision was bought out by Microsoft. So who knows exactly what's going to happen with that. Yeah, sadly, the future of many classic titles is a little bit in the unknown area. But yeah, I would say we have covered more or less the history part. So I would say it's time maybe to go for pros and cons. Maybe Owen knows it already, which is the biggest pro here in the room for me. <laughs> it's the amazing co-op feature. Captain Co-op Sedaris, everybody. <laughs> It's, for me at least, the best LAN party game. It's an unbelievable feeling if you have a LAN party of six friends in two different teams playing this game. The amazing weapon feeling, the sounds. Ah, it's a dream. It's really a dream. Absolutely. And this it came out at such a very interesting point in the history of co-op games because it was, it was like not the newest co-op game on the block right like you've got diablo you've got your other games like that that were like very early internet era but it's when we started seeing like left for dead and like the those like co-op shooters were like just starting to become a thing and swap forward like hit the scene and even then like when it came out there was not another co-op shooter that i can think of anyway until again left for dead came out and I would say there is still to this game not many games who have this level of detail for, in that case, police work, the strict rules you have to follow basically, combined with an unbelievable level design. There is an amazing YouTube video which focuses entirely on the aesthetics of the game. It's unbelievable how much of everything they put into this game. For example, they put little post-its on monitors in offices. They uh, have a map where you see basically um, a computer company switching slowly from the big, ugly screens to the small TFT panels. Stuff like this makes games unbelievable to play. It's just an unbelievable, unbelievable atmospheric sense, basically. You know, that's actually a detail that I didn't notice, as embarrassing as that is, that I, di I didn't even notice that they had, like, that some of the computers in their building had, I believe the li the level that you're talking about is red library offices, but I didn't notice that detail, but that's definitely, yeah, like, some of them are CRT monitors and some of them are flat screens. That's interesting. But yeah, it speaks levels. Yeah. It speaks levels to their design and just how well these levels are put together. And, and like you said, still to this day, I don't think there's another game that has 
the same type of rules of engagement or the procedures that you have to follow for police work. Again, I think the closest one that comes to that is ready or not. And even just like in co-op shooters in general, there's not a lot of routines like that. It's funny looking back on this now, but like when Payday the Heist came out, it was actually compared to SWAT 4 because it has a co-op aspect that is very much about like, you need to follow a routine, a procedure. You need to, you know, you need to do this to rob the bank. You got to get this special equipment and stuff like that. There's, there's interesting parallels between the two games. I was so disappointed by this game. I thought it was, it was SWAT 4 on the bad side, basically. And yeah, it was so disappointing that the police basically beams into the, the corridors and jumps from the walls and there's an unending stream of police officers coming to you. Oh God, it was unbelievable bad for me. Yeah, I mean, I have mixed feelings about it, to be honest, because I, I, I played like maybe 500 hours of it, of Payday 2. But I, I get where you're coming from, though. Like, it, it's definitely more of like an action shootery type of game than SWAT 4 is. And yeah, I can see why it would be a disappointment for sure. But on the other hand, later on in Payday 2, they added like pre planning and stuff like that, which again, I think is very much like the core DNA of SWAT 4 is like you need to go into a mission and you need to think about how you're going to approach it. And like, am I going to take gas masks? Or am I going to take flashbang stuff? That I totally would have loved. I also played the second part. If they would have combined it with a realistic aspect. It's so unrealistic that they, they have more police officers as a big city like New York. Or that the weapons don't really have a punch in, in SWAT 4 to come back to this game. Their weapons are really powerful. Even if you have a little pistol, you really have the feeling, okay, I can hurt the players who are attacking me or the, the NPCs. And that's not sadly the case in Payday. Oh yeah, it's very jarring, yeah. Another aspect I really love is the, the replay value this game offers because everything is a little bit randomized. The enemies are in different locations, the hostage are in different locations, the behavior of the NPCs are even strange sometimes maybe they fake the surrender and as soon as you turn your back to them they will pop a cap into your head so you have really to adapt to every new round completely different it's really really nice oh yeah absolutely like i said earlier this game utilizes the same ai system as tribes did and also the same ai system that bioshock does but out of these three games i would say Definitely SWAT 4 is the one where it's made for it. And like they really utilized all of the little levers in Tyrion's AI system. Not a lot of people will know this, but like on the fun time amusements level, for example, there's a chance that somebody has some drugs and will actually flush it down the toilet. Like that's the only level where that happens in. And there's another mission Fresnel Street Station, where they'll actually like run down the train tracks and escape off the level. And they're actually like very complicated in terms of how everything is set up. Like they'll, the suspects will like run away and they'll barricade themselves in a room and lock all the doors. If they feel confronted and they feel very aggressive, they'll actually threaten the life of a hostage. And if you don't react fast enough and take them down, they'll actually take the hostage's life and end the mission that way. And your own AI, by the way, because this is a single player and a multiplayer game. You have a single player version of the game where you can command your AI controlled officers to breach doors. Or I think in the expansion pack, they also added the ability to chain up or queue commands. And then you can click a button and they'll just they'll coordinate everything so like there's not another game really like this at all they really have some really unique ai in this game one other thing i find unique here is that you can even see the gear your character has or the gear other players on the, the LAN party basically have just by looking at their belt how many grenades are there it's such a nice little detail 
Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And another thing that I didn't think about, you were talking about the random generation before is that there's actually like specific rules about their randomization. Like, so for example, on the level Mount Threshold Research Center, you're looking for the doctor, the researcher, but also you have to look for his briefcase because it has important stuff that doesn't want to get destroyed. But actually, he can spawn in like maybe four or five different areas, but always his briefcase spawns in the same room as him. So I think little details like that don't get like a lot of attention put on them. Like there's a lot of detail on this game. It's definitely very versatile. You mentioned there is also a PvP aspect in this game. And I have to say, I also enjoyed this part really, really. Because it's not like in Counter-Strike that, again, the weapons here have a punch. So if you play VIP Escort, you have a VIP who really has a pistol which can hurt the enemy. And in Counter-Strike, it's, yeah, a water pistol. It's not just like the weapon weight themselves that's actually unique about these modes necessarily, but there's also a feature called arresting where if you... Yeah, take I wanted to go to that directly. Yeah. It's amazing. Please continue. Yeah, so in this game, unlike I can't think of any other games aside from Ready or Not that do this, but if you use a less than lethal piece of equipment on an enemy, for example, pepper spray or a taser or a flashbang grenade, etc. It'll actually make them unable to attack and they'll walk very slowly. Or if they're tased, they don't walk at all. They just kind of be stunned on the ground. But when they're in this state of being stunned, you can actually go up and arrest them. And that has some different implications for the different modes of the game. So for example, barricaded suspects, which is probably closest to like a team free-for-all you know if you kill somebody that's worth one point but if you arrest somebody that's worth five points so there's a very much a bigger incentive to arresting your enemies as opposed to just killing them outright which honestly is probably for the better because most of the weapons handle pretty much the same except for the ak which does amazingly so just everybody uses the AK in multiplayer, which I guess is like a con more than a pro, right? But like, for example, the less than lethal equipment that you have is actually negated by some other pieces of equipment. So for example, if you have flashbangs, if your enemy has a helmet on with goggles, then they're not actually affected by flashbangs at all. But if you're, you're using gas and they have a gas mask, then they're not affected by it. So you have to be very... Uh, strategic in terms of what equipment that you use most of the time though and again this might be a con just in general with the game balance there's stinger grenades which um they're kind of like flashbangs except instead of a big bang they have rubber balls in them that stun people uh there's not really a way to negate stinger grenades aside from having heavy armor which slows you down a lot so like in practice a lot of people just throw stinger grenades everywhere so like barricaded suspects, that's one mode, right? There's also rapid deployment, which let's be honest here, not a lot of people play, which is where you have to defuse bombs in the map as SWAT or defend them as suspects. But another one where the arrest mechanic plays a very big role in is VIP escort. You had mentioned this mode a little bit earlier, but to give context for other people who don't know what this mode is or the rules behind it, SWAT and suspects, the two teams. The SWAT team has to escort the VIP from one point of the map to the other point of the map. Now, if the VIP dies for any reason at all before being arrested, then the other team that didn't kill them loses. Like, if you kill the VIP in your SWAT, like, you lose. Come on, man, don't kill your teammates, right? If your suspects, though... And you kill the VIP, if he's just running along and you just shoot him, like, you lose. Because the whole point of this mode is that you have to actually detain the VIP. And after you have held him for two minutes, and SWAT can go and free him in that two-minute span of time. Like, after that two minutes up and you kill him, then you win. So it's very complex rules for the suspects, because you have to not only be on the lookout for SWAT who are trying to kill you because they don't have an incentive to arrest you at all. They have to look out for the SWAT people and they have to be very cautious to arrest the VIP. 
either through like their stinger grenades or their pepper spray or, or whatever. The expansion also introduced the mode smash and grab, which again, not a lot of people play, but essentially it's kind of like, it's sort of like VIP escort. The suspects or uh, shoot, this is showing my age here because I, I don't actually remember the rules of it all that well, but you essentially have to transport a case across the map. I think the suspects have to transport it across the map or something. But the arrest mechanic comes into play here as well because there's like a time limit in terms of how long the case has to get there. But if you arrest somebody, then the time limit changes for it. So like, for example, if the suspects arrest somebody, then the time increases on it and gives them a little bit more time to escort the case. But if SWAT arrests somebody, then the time limit goes down. So like this arrest mechanic, as far as I know, is not in any other game that aside from ready or not that at least that i know of even though i know it wasn't that popular to play pvp in SWAT 4 i really enjoyed it because it really spiced multiplayer gameplay so up if you can arrest people if it affects the the gameplay by adding or subtracting uh, the time it's yeah unique so sad that it wasn't played that much yeah for sure and the elite force mod like I didn't actually include any support for those modes. It was purely a co-op mod. So like I kind of made it worse in that respect because I could have provided quality of life support for it, but just for technical reasons, I couldn't do it. One thing I also want to mention is it's a big pro that this game has a LAN and direct IP support. <laughs> it's so rare nowadays and yeah, even today, with such a small community, you open up a server and there are randomly people who are joining you. It happens to us a few times. We played it and, oh, random people, number three appears. Nice. Yeah, almost every time we've uh, fired a, a game up um, and Cat's been hosting his own server, we've had someone random join us, which is always interesting because, of course, we play with Discord voice chat on and then someone else turns up who isn't part of our call. Which makes it interesting. Oh, absolutely. And like, like I was alluding to before, it's like you can play and just random people will join. And sometimes there'll be people that you haven't seen in a really long time. It's just such a fascinating community to me. If they are still checking the servers, it's really nice after such a long time. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's unfortunate that a lot of games don't let you host anything anymore. I mean, you were talking about LAN. And that made me think of the situation again. Another company owned by uh, now Microsoft, but Blizzard with Diablo 2. The original game actually supported LAN. And when they came out with the remake of it, the resurrected edition of it, they actually took that out, surprisingly. And you're not allowed to do that anymore. Ouch. Just today, I read about an RTS title who stopped basically uh, development two years ago was pushed off to a different company they supported servers for two more years now they're shutting down the game has a single player component but still, since they don't have the source code and you need an always a, a, always a, a, always a connection to the internet an entire game is dying without any real reason it's just a bad excuse not to have a direct ip support yeah, yeah, it drives me nuts that um, a, a company can be so short-sighted or so uncaring as to think, um, yeah, well, people probably won't want to play this in five years' time anyway, so we'll just turn it off. The game was from 2020, three years. <laughs> Good lord. Wow. Really, there is no excuse for me that a company comes here and say, oh, we only have matchmaking because direct IP support is old school and who has a LAN party anymore? Fuck you, I have. Nerd! Yep. I mean, that just makes me think of Counter-Strike. Do they have that feature in Counter-Strike 2? Can you do a LAN party in Counter-Strike 2? I don't think so, but Counter-Strike is a totally different chapter because I'm not sure if you have noticed, they re-released the game. Counter-Strike GO is officially dead. They re-released Counter-Strike 2 now. They basically took all the reviews all the skins and everything, put it into the new title. So it's a new game with thousands of good reviews. 
but the big but here they removed all community content everything from the workshop isn't playable any longer you have to downgrade the game to csgo which you can do but the main game has just a few maps many of the game modes are gone all of the community content gone wow what a mess so having an old school title like Spot 4, which offers just direct IP support. I love it. I mean, speaking as somebody who has created content for not just Spot 4, but like a lot of different game communities, like I would be gutted if my stuff just disappeared one day and people weren't able to play it anymore. That's also part of why I'm really strongly into open sourcing stuff because I think it's very important that people be able to essentially own their own stuff. Like you, if, if you have the source code to it, then you can just recompile it on a new computer if the computer is having issues with you. I, I mean, obviously the software development kit is just a small portion of swat force code, but like, for example, if there's a bug in the mod and you want to fix it, then just go ahead and fix it. You know, like you don't need me around to fix it. It's still providing a way for everybody who is everybody who wants to play it can play it in their own way. It's a frustrating thing to me when there's so much concentration and so much overly ownership of a gameplay experience that it, it ruins it. I understand the concept of IP. I'm not saying that I'm ignorant to the concept of IP or ignorant to the concept of copyright or I don't understand the value of an artist's ability to express themselves. But at the same time, it's also about players and players are going to play the game how they want to play it. And, you know, if somebody wants to cheat their way through the single player campaign of the game, like, why should I care if they want to do that? I'll even tell them how to do it. I'll tell them how to skip specific missions if they're giving them trouble. Like, it's even bugged in the game. And again, another con of the game is that it has a lot of bugs. Like, there's a game-breaking bug that sometimes campaign progress doesn't progress for some reason and you're stuck on the same level. And the way to fix that is essentially cheating. You have to advance the game yourself through configuration files. I just, I think there's something to be said about, like, ownership of your ability to play a game and ownership of how you play a game that just isn't talked about anymore. And it, it frustrates me. Yeah, especially if you consider you paid... $60 or sometimes more if you have a special edition and after five years, 10 years, company says, no, we don't care. You can't even log into the game anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And like, even just like another example of this, that kind of bothers me a little bit, again, it's showing how much I kind of like Blizzard games here, but like World of Warcraft, for example, right? Like they had World of Warcraft and then they had the expansion packs that kind of just invalidated all of your progress there. And then they just keep going on with these expansion packs and it's like you don't really have any sense of progress over your stuff. But again, that's a that's a whole different conversation. I don't want to take up too much of your guys' time here. But I would like to stay on the track of maybe negative things. If you don't have uh, more positive, especially Owen, at least. Hadn't any chance I talked to so much. <laughs> oh, no, no, quite right. Actually, something that I did think of earlier was talking about the game balance. Easy, you mentioned the uh, the fact that most non-lethal equipment has <clears throat> some way to negate it on the other side, uh, except for the stinger. But I think there are some ways that um, even then the stinger can be negated by the environment. For example, we were playing just earlier this evening and Cap threw a stinger into a room. We were playing on one of the, uh, one of the levels where they're uh, in a drug lab and um it blew a tank up so there there are some ways where it, 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 not just um, against other players but the environment itself can can negate the use of certain uh, well the stinger at the very least um and i thought that was spectacular because of course the way the game at least from my perspective is most enjoyed is if you are thinking tactically and that's another way to motivate and, and to incentivize that and i know you said um, you've got to think about what what kit you're going to take into the encounter but it's not just the enemy that you've got to consider it's also the environment i thought that was spectacular do you just say that it wasn't a good idea for me to throw a grenade, a stinger grenade, down a corridor where hostages are and, yeah, some bad guys? Oh, no criticism. Um, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Sure it, was, it was perfectly tactically sound decision-making. Yeah, yeah definitely, it was. 
I mean, at least he didn't throw the flashbang into the baby crib. I mean, come on. No, that's <laughs> something for the future, I guess. Oh, good idea. We'll give that a go. Okay, so like speaking on game balance here, like when we're talking about game balance for this game specifically, it gets a little bit complicated because you have to consider the competitive side of the game and the co-op side of the game. So just speaking on the competitive side of the game here, it's it's bad. It's not balanced, guys. It's not good. Like everybody runs with AKs and stinger grenades and everybody just kind of spams stinger grenades and shoots each other with the AKs. Like there's not really a tactical reason to pick anything other than that because you're just going to mop the floor with everybody else. I mean, you can use flashbangs to kind of surprise people, but the minute you start using them, everybody's going to take a helmet in their kit and it's kind of pointless. Speaking on the co-op side of things, it's a little bit better. So for frame of reference, in terms of less lethal equipment, there's the less lethal shotgun, which shoots bean bags. There's the pepper ball gun, which shoots kind of like a pepper spray kind of projectile. There's pepper spray itself, flashbangs, CS gas, tear gas, stinger grenades, which again, shoot little rubber balls similar to a flashbang and the taser. So in terms of tactical analysis here and game balance wise, the game will score you out of a hundred points when you play it. So if you complete a mission with arresting everybody and nobody dies and nobody gets hurt, it's a very clean mission. You get a hundred out of a hundred a plus the game really strongly incentivizes you to use the less than lethal stuff, which is fine because that's how essentially real police wants to operate. They want to have a clean, nobody gets hurt, everybody gets arrested, everybody faces the justice system. And that's fine, except it really punishes you for not using the less than lethal stuff. Unfortunately, most of the time, that means you're going to be going into a room using CS gas because that floods everything in the room. And while everybody is stunned, you can shout at them and arrest them. Or if they're not compliant, then you can use like a beanbag round from your beanbag shotgun or a taser or maybe pepper spray or something like that. Or even more crazily, which is not tactical at all, not how real life works at all. You can run in with no armor. You can go very fast. You can pepper spray everybody and arrest them, which is legitimately how I've beaten several missions, even in Elite Force. So like the balance is kind of weird. There's not really a reason why you should use a lethal weapon. Like even in Elite Force, like Elite Force kind of mitigates the problem a little bit, but you still get more points if you use less lethal stuff. Like you don't risk penalties because again, in this game, there's a rule of engagement system. You can't just go and shoot everybody like if you shoot somebody and they're running away from you or you haven't even announced yourself as police you get penalized for it and it's even more severe if you kill somebody versus incapacitate somebody so like there's less of an incentive for you to use lethal force which is unfortunate because there's kind of an added challenge for you to use lethal force so that's kind of like a big con for me with the game is that the balance is just kind of odd like it's a very in-depth police simulator and it is realistic in the sense that it incentivizes you more towards less than lethal equipment but the less than lethal equipment itself is held up on a pedestal and even when i was playing on frosty server back in the day there was a bot that would sit there and kick you out of the server if you actually got too many penalties and if you weren't using lethal force then there's no chance that you would get a penalty and get kicked out of the server right so like of course everybody's going to be running less than lethal stuff so like there's a, a very real balance problem there i think another problem here is that the rules of lethal engagement aren't really well explained especially the point system isn't really in the tutorial even i think they could have done there a better job getting the player familiarized with the system and in addition to that especially on the LAN parties back then we always felt a little bit frustrated when a bad guy basically 
jumped us out of nowhere, had a weapon thrown at us, and we lose points because we reacted to a situation and it was justified, basically, to do so. I know it's a, a engine limitation, let's call it that, but it was frustrating. Yeah, so to give a little bit more context for people who haven't played this game or maybe watching this video and maybe are a little bit confused, the game itself has a rules of engagement system and there's a concept of a clean kill versus one that initiates penalties. And like I said earlier, you scored out of 100. So if somebody is pointing their weapon at you or at a hostage, then in that situation and in that situation alone, you are considered eligible to kill them, basically. You can use lethal force on them. And you also have to announce yourself as a SWAT officer for them to do this, right? If somebody just points their gun at you and you haven't shouted at them, then they're technically right to shoot you. It's self-defense. You haven't announced yourself as police, so you'll get dinged points for this. Now, most first-person shooter game players aren't going to be super familiar with this mechanic going in. Most first-person shooter players, even myself going into this game when I played it initially, they're just going to run around and shoot everybody because that's how the market has treated video games like this up until now. And this is a very realistic police simulator. It's not a shooting game on the face of it but what makes this worse is that they don't explain this to you at all like at any point during the tutorial other than a brief mention by sonny bonds who's just saying like well you can't shoot everybody but like that's about it there's not really an explanation for this in the game it's just kind of like there and another thing that makes it even worse by far worse than this is that you don't actually find out that you've got a penalty until the end of the mission. And, like, you've just played through a whole mission. There might be, like, 20 suspects that you've shot at. And you're dinged for lethal force that wasn't authorized. Like, at what point did that happen? You know, like, you can't remember when that happened. And, like I said, this wasn't explained to anybody. This isn't even very well telegraphed in the game itself. Because if somebody is aiming their weapon at you... And, like, literally a millisecond later they're giving up and you shoot them just because your reaction time isn't good enough, then that's considered an unauthorized use of force. And, like I said earlier, it's made worse by the fact that you don't get any kind of instant feedback from that, which is something that I fixed in Elite Force. If in Elite Force you actually get unauthorized force used on somebody, it'll actually pop up a little penalty thing and tell you that you did that which I think goes a long way to explaining how the actual game mechanics work. Yeah, I noticed that. It was really helpful. Um, and, uh, yeah. I was just going to I was going to mention other cons, but if you have something else. I was just going to say, of course, sometimes you're just a bit shit. Um, like, for example, as we were playing this evening, something I always, I always find it interesting how you subdue the hostages as well as the, uh, the perpetrators or the suspects. And we had, a, we had a point this evening where I had subdued a hostage. In fact, I think it's the, ch the guy you were talking about earlier, because I think he was just in the middle of saying something about his briefcase. When I attempted to report that I had, um, you know, secured a hostage, uh, and instead of pressing the middle button, I pressed the left button and shot him in the back. Um, that one I knew. Nice. I knew I'd done that. That was pretty obvious that I'd fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> Don't understand why. It was justified. He had a really yeah. annoying voice. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um... I guess that's a, a pro of the game too, right? Is that it actually exposes you to like how police procedure works and makes you think about it. Like, like it might seem kind of confusing to you. Like, why are you tying up all of the innocent people or the people who don't have a weapon? But the truth of the matter is like, you don't actually know if they have a weapon. You don't know if they're involved or not. In fact, in the game itself, there are several suspects that don't openly carry weapons. They will pick them up from other places in the level. A food wall, for example, the, Actually, the very first mission that you play in the vanilla Swamp 4 game has several suspects that can actually pick up a weapon off of a table and use it. They don't actually carry any weapons. So right. even restraining the civilians, you know, is police procedure stuff that most people don't know about. Yeah. How do you feel personally about the fact that the game doesn't have a real story? The missions are not connected. Makes it more realistic, I think, because most police calls aren't going to be like you might have repeated calls to a residence if something is happening there. But like, how do you translate that into a game? I don't know. 
but I think Stechkov Syndicate actually does have a plot to it, and it, it does kind of an okay job of telling the plot, but it sort of feels like Hollywood, you know, kind of made up, I guess. It's more realistic to me, I think. Definitely. As a side job, I'm a voluntary paramedic, so I totally understand that you have one job, and after it's done, basically, yeah, you have only the job in, in your reports and in your memory, and it's not really important anymore for you personal. So the only thing I could maybe imagine that they would maybe make a, a soap opera story around that, or maybe one of my other favorite features of the modern gaming era, unlockable stuff. So no, I think it's also fine that they didn't do that. Yeah, I think Ready or Not has a, a plot as well. It's probably changed since I was there, though. I also read sometimes on the internet that people complained that you couldn't save during the missions. I can understand that this is a really bad problem for a single-player game, but I don't have a problem if it's a co-op game. If it's fun, I even haven't a problem losing. So, yeah, not a problem for me there. How about you guys? I think as far as that goes... It's a weird one, right? Because if you want to make the game more realistic, then you're going to, for example, on hotels or something like that, that have hundreds of rooms to clear, then you're going to need a save feature because that's like hundreds of rooms that you got to clear and doing that over and over again is going to be hard. I think that the developers of the game, for the most part, did a pretty good job of keeping the mission small and tight so that saving isn't really an issue. I think the only ones that it comes to be a problem are like the last missions in the game which uh they they're long there's a lot of suspects the suspects are harder i can kind of see the saving being an issue there and there's the technical aspect as well isn't there if, if, you, if you are playing in a, a, a co-op or a pvp environment how how, how would that even work what is it going to store everybody's particular location at the time and I think you'd have to structure the missions around having maybe save points or um, when you've reached uh, success with a certain number of... Um, oops, sorry, my brain is failing me. Things you meant to do. Um, then maybe you could pick up from that point. But I don't I don't see how manual saving would work, really. I don't. And as you said, Cap, it doesn't really matter to me. I enjoy losing as well as part of the challenge. And again, as you said, Easy, I think the uh, the maps and the missions are so well structured that... None of them are going to take so much of your time that um, replaying after a failure is a major ball ache. But no, I think it works fine. I don't, I don't think that's a fair criticism. I can kind of see it for, like like I said, Old Granite Hotel or Mount Threshold Research Center, which have like 20 to 30 suspects in them and are fairly large. But most of them, I would say it's not an issue. But to be honest, even the game tells you, if you create a multiplayer server, that those are missions for big groups. So, yes, yeah. definitely. And playing in single player is a different beast because you're alone with your teammates. So like four AI companions plus yourself, it's five people. But in multiplayer, you can go up to 16 people and clear levels like nothing. Since I haven't really touched the single player, what would you say? Is the AI a pro or a con? <laughs> is it a pro or a con? Well, it depends. So... On the one hand, at least in Elite Force anyway, they are like very smart and very with it. And even in the vanilla game, honestly, they're very quick shots. And I felt like anyway, going into it, that aside from the last couple of missions where they just get mowed down easily, they're pretty solid. They do tend to bug out a lot. I think it's a pro that they're there because it's a very strong technical feat to have that kind of AI in the game. Do I think that they're better than SWAT 3's AI? Uh, no, they're kind of a downgrade in a lot of ways. But do I think that they're a pro to the game? Yes, because otherwise you really wouldn't be able to play single player at all. And having single player, I think, is a good thing ultimately. Yeah, definitely, especially on older games, having a training side is always a plus. I also would even say, yeah, from what I noticed, especially another great YouTube video out there, it's 
very complicated how they are built, basically. Especially if you consider the, the stupid Counter-Strike bots. They store a lot of different informations, have different pathways, face different direction on different factors. It's really intriguing how they came up with that idea of that interface and everything. It looks nice. Oh, yeah. It's very... Oh, man. It's very complicated. Like, there's so many different layers to it. But essentially, each AI will have its own individual goal. And for that goal, the goal being something very vague, like engage with opponent, or it could be something very specific, like go to that area. There's a number of different actions that can occur for that particular goal. So for example, let's say we're talking about a suspect. They have the goal of engage with an officer. And to satisfy that goal, there are a number of different actions that can take place. One of those actions could be to just instantly start shooting at the SWAT officer. Another one might be to take cover. Another one might be to literally run out of the room and barricade yourself in another room. Uh, I'm sure there's others that I'm forgetting about. But whether or not they take a specific action depends on a number of different variables. So, for example, they can't take cover if there's not any cover available. They won't threaten a hostage if there's not any hostages available. They won't shoot at a SWAT officer if they can't see the SWAT officer. So goals and actions is one layer. There's also another layer on top of that called resources. And for the most part, this is kind of underutilized in SWAT. But for example, you can't use a weapon resource if you don't have any ammo. So being able to shoot at a SWAT officer requires that you have a weapon resource available to you. There's a whole system of like avoidance and looking at specific points when you go upstairs, for example, like SWAT. If they're going up a flight of stairs, they'll actually look towards the top of the stairs. If you're moving in a room with the SWAT, like if they're following you, they'll actually look at different quadrants of the room to make sure that there's not any threats coming by. If they hear a sound, there's smart intelligence there that makes it so that only one of the SWAT officers of your group actually looks towards the sound so that the others aren't like all looking at the same direction. There's, oh man, there's, there's so many different layers to it. And like I was talking about earlier with the goals and actions, that also has a squad layer to it. So like your squad can have a goal and actions for those goals. So like a squad, for example, could have, and a squad here being either red team, blue team, or element, they could have a goal of breach clear the room. And one of the actions could be like, they go through an open door or they open the door or there's a lot of different things to it basically is what I'm trying to say. And the Tyrion AI system is a little bit flawed because it is complex and is easy to get confused if you don't know what you're doing, but it's a very interesting and unique way of solving the problem. And there is for me, the last con, which I didn't really face myself, but the interface could have been a little bit more future proof. I like that you can adjust the resolution in the config files, but everybody who has a 4K monitor eh, can have some problems, especially in the font size. Yeah, I'll be honest with you here. I don't necessarily see that as being a fair criticism of the game because it was very rare for any game really to support any kind of widescreen resolutions at the time. Pretty much every single Quake 3 game doesn't have the option for it in their menus. Pretty much every Unreal game at the time doesn't have it in their menus. Majority of games for 2D, like talking like Age of Empires here, for example, StarCraft, like all of those support only like a fixed number of resolutions. Again, the example of Diablo 2 here only supported 640 by 480 and 800 by 600. So it would be very unusual for a game at the time to support that kind of resolution. Well, 
to be honest, 2005 was already the time where widescreen came more and more into the picture. Many laptops had this resolution. And I can understand why it's happening, totally. But if you consider that many old titles have the option to display unbelievable resolutions for, let's say, a title from 1997 or a 6, there is 10 years of development time. And the widescreen resolution is already on the horizon. They could have thought about that. Uh, yeah, perhaps, I suppose so. But like I said, it's like more of the exception rather than the rule that those types of games would have been around, at least in my experience anyway. I, I don't have the numbers to back that up, but just in general, I think a good example of where that kind of support is present is like Valve's games. I feel like Source Engine games in particular were very future-proof. Uh, even yeah. the Gold Source games did a very good job of supporting higher resolutions, but I struggle to think of a lot of other examples that supported those kinds of resolutions. I, I totally agree that um, throughout the 2000s, I had a, a variety of Alienware laptops because I was a chill for Alienware at the time. And if memory serves, all of them had 1610 screens. And almost every single game I played through the decade was stretched out and squishy, except for Half-Life 2. So yeah, it certainly wasn't an industry standard. I mean, I, I agree with you, Cab, that I, I wish it had been more supported. But I also agree with you, Easy, that it's, there's no point in that particular criticism at this game, because nobody was doing it. It was, it was incredibly frustrating to have a screen that wasn't 4x3. Yeah, I would say, like, a good criticism, I guess, sort of the elephant in the room, is just, like, the amount of bugs that this game had. To be honest... I didn't really encounter so many bugs. Of course, s some strange behavior of the AI, which, yeah, it's AI. I expect it sometimes. But c can you share a few really bad ones? Yeah, sure. So just off the top of my head, and again, a lot of these have been fixed in Elite Force. So, but for example, there's the one that I mentioned earlier where like, and this is still even present in Elite Force, but... Sometimes there's a campaign bug where you just don't advance for some reason. That hasn't really been fully explained to me. Like, there's not a specific reason why that happens. Another one is that the sound sometimes just doesn't work. And this is actually even a problem in Bioshock as well. Let me see. I, I might cheat a little bit here and look at the list of bugs that have been fixed on the Elite Force readme file. Before you go on there... One thing comes to mind, I guess every SWAT player noticed this problem at some point. Where is the fucking last weapon or item you have to find? Is he lying on it? Is it glitch it? Where is it? We had uh, one drug bag, which was basically under his knee. We saw just a tip of it. We sadly had to punch the suspect. So he moved away and we could take the drug item. Yeah, that's definitely a gameplay problem, I feel like. It will actually wait until you find the last one before it goes to the next mission. And a lot of servers don't have the voting feature enabled on them. So, like, it, it tends to stall out because everybody's looking for that last weapon. And, and actually, that's another bug that's worth mentioning, is that the position of the equipment, like, the evidence and stuff like that will actually be like not synced properly between client and server. So like, for example, the server might think that you have a weapon that's dropped upstairs, but the client might think that it fell through the floor and is somewhere else. And for one person in the game, they'll look at that and they'll be like, oh, the gun's here. And it's like, well, that's weird. It's not there, actually. You'll try and pick it up, but it won't actually work because the server thinks that the weapon's still upstairs. And that can actually, like, break your progression unless, like, you, like I said, you use the voting feature and skip the map. There's, like, a lot of little AI bugs. There's a bug that used to exist a while ago where you would be limping, like you were injured from a leg injury, but you didn't actually have a leg injury. Again, because of little desync issues between client and server. I fixed a lot of them in Elite Force, and now they're kind of, like, out of sight, out of mind. I kind of forgot about a lot of them, but like there were quite a few of them. I guess one that exists in Elite Force again is you can pick a weapon 
and it won't actually like select that weapon sometimes that's kind of annoying but that's yeah there's just quirks like that that kind of crop up over the the years so more polishing problems than really game breaking stuff yeah aside from like the sound not working in the campaign progression one there's not really that many like game breaking ones it's just like a lot of little nuisance ones oh and and also like the ones with the rules of engagement where it's like it feels like it's not actually like it doesn't feel like you got like it feels like bs basically right like yeah yeah it feels <laughs> like you should have gotten a clean kill there but you didn't and probably you're right but just the game is a little bit not so lenient well i would say that's everything for the pros and cons maybe move on to a quick subject the unique aspect of the game what is for me personal very unique and rare in gaming is that the mega scenes are real entities here and if you shoot four bullets you still have 26 bullets in it you switch the magazine those 26 bullets are still in the magazine when you reload that magazine again it's so rare yeah, they had a definite focus on realism with this game. And the magazine one is just one example. The rules of engagement, again, is, is a very unique feature of the game. Do you think this is in any other game? The magazines, definitely, but the, the, the rules, maybe in SWAT 3. Yeah, I they were probably in SWAT 3 and in Ready or Not, but I can't think of any other game. Also, that was definitely in all the police quests and SWAT 3. But still unique is that you have even so many non-lethal weapons and the, the, the gear and everything. It's really interesting. The Opti one, for example, is also ah so nice. I want something for home. I think I asked my parents for one of those for Christmas one year. Sadly, I don't think you could pick them up at Best Buy. I mean, yeah. yeah, that's another one. Yeah, there's a lot of unique gear and the less lethal thing is definitely not something I've seen in another game. Ooh, something else I never saw in a game was the, how is it called in English? Those slides you can uh, knick and leave on the floor. Ah, uh, yes, the light sticks, yeah. Yeah, it's, is there any game who has them? It's a small little detail, but nice. Yeah, I can't think of any. Then, of course, next. In, in today's age, we are very used from television that the Every police officer has a body cam and films everything all the time. But having it in a game, I think SWAT 4 could maybe be the first where you can hit a key and you see the view of a different player. Oh, yeah. And, and not only that, if you're in single player mode, you can actually issue orders through that body cam. Oh, yeah. I forgot that. Yeah, true. Yeah, I can't, I can't think of another game that's done that, actually. It's sadly like it has a lot of potential on its own to be a really cool feature like even just thinking of a game where there's a bunch of other ai officers and you're not actually in the game it'd be very interesting to see a game where you only issue commands through the body cam i think something like that would be really cool well what's the rts title yeah actually another thing this might fall under your next question i suppose so i might save it but um there's actually a hidden feature in the game where you could take the camera and go top down with it. It's like a hidden console command where you, I think the feature is called battlegrounds or, or something like that, where you can actually like look pop down at the whole level and issue commands to your AI squad members. Yeah. It doesn't ring a bell. A little bit cheaty, isn't it? <laughs> you suddenly get the God view. Oh yeah, for sure. The last unique thing on my list would be basically having 10 players in one co-op session. It was so frustrating on so many LAN parties that we hit this stupid player limit of four or five players and we had always one more. And here, yeah, no problem. 10 players. Enjoy. I almost kind of think that that's a good thing though, because with a co-op game having a smaller player count means that you have better coordination and better cohesion because thinking of for example like world of warcraft i mean it's not technically a co-op game exactly but 
there are raids in there that are like 40 players, you know, and thinking of the level of cohesion that you need and like the stress of commanding that many people is like, yeah, like <laughs> that's, that's a pretty intense scenario. I feel like. Well, that's totally true. That goes more in the direction of more simulation gameplay. I think of the armor titles here where you have servers with 200 people sometimes. That's a totally different genre and uh, problem, of course. But I say, wh why basically limit the players by a number? Of course, you can design the, the map for four or five players, but why should I as the developer care if there are six players playing it? Doesn't make so much sense. Mm. I think it has to be designed around, though. Like, for example, in Swap 4, having 16 players, um, they added the ability to have 16 players in the expansion pack. So, like, a lot of the older maps that weren't part of the expansion pack, like, for example, Fairfax Residence, which only has, I think, two suspects max in it, and try running that on 16 players, like, that's going to be, like... That's crowded. Yeah, it's crowded. Yeah, really tight corridors and stuff like that. But it's something that you have to design around. And like I said, I think it could be, it could kind of go either way. It could be a good thing or a bad thing. It can get pretty chaotic. I'm totally with you on the part that the design aspect is, hey, we have this goal, four players for this map or even two. That's totally fine. But why limit the player? I so I know so many games where the community created fun game modes just by messing around. So many old school titles were limited by, let's say, eight or 16 players because of the technology, the, the internet bandwidth. And when those problems were solved, they increased the limit. And yeah, those maps were crowded, definitely, but the community still enjoyed it. So why limit it? Yeah, I guess that's sort of like it's an interesting question because if you think about it like the most popular game in the world right now is fortnite and that's a game that has 100 people i think right 100 people playing it at the same time but it's strictly a competitive affair if we think about cooperative there's not really a huge cooperative game like that there easily could be though right i would say armor armor and maybe all those um survival games where you build big bases and have to fend off against uh, zombies and other players. Yeah, I, I totally I... understand that, that you always have to consider the fun aspect and uh, the technology sense, but especially since we are all here love mods, I think we, we don't like limitations in that sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um... I can't think of any other unique features, though. Okay, then um, I would say before we move to the next question, I move quickly back to the cons, because when we talked about cameras, something came up. I always hated it that when you died, that you couldn't see the weapons and the interaction of the, the players you watch who are still in the game. And for example, use the OptiWand, and you can't see the opti went the camera. Yeah, and I mean, even in co-op, I feel like the opti wand in particular is a little bit buggy and janky due to ping, I feel like. So having the ability to see that through the eyes of your spectator would have been really cool. Unfortunately, I think the way that it's technically implemented is like they stick a camera to the front of the third person model and they hide the body that you're looking through so it looks like very bad honestly well uh since you guys don't have anything else and i don't have anything else let's talk quickly also about what we wish for a new sequel what, what should be in a new sequel basically one thing we mentioned and i also would agree maybe give us a better tutorial teaching the rules and a, a very big, big pipe dream for me 
if we back my toilet factor. And by toilet factor, I, I mean, I want a manual which I can take to the toilet and read the whole fucking thing. <laughs> For example, the rules or g give me background details about the characters I play. I, I want immersions outside of the game, outside, uh, away from my computer. So give me my, back my toilet factor. Yeah, manuals are a dying breed for sure. I used to call it the bus ride home factor because you know you'd go and buy a game and then read the read the manual and absorb all the information about the game on the way home. So it was all there by the time we got it installed. Yep, I definitely remember that from older games yeah. for sure. Especially if you play those crazy simulations like X Wing or Wing Commander, had great manuals. I think as far as what I would like to see in a new SWAT four kind of game is definitely some acknowledgement in terms of the kinds of narratives in the game. And what I mean by this, and I might get like a little bit of heat for this, is that there's been a fundamental change in terms of how the media, how people, how everybody treats police officers between now and between when SWAT 4 came out. I think if you ask a random person on the street, they're either going to tell you that they hate the police or that they see the police as necessary or that they respect the police and want them around and, you know, that sort of thing. But I think just, it's, it's such a complex thing. Like, it's something that says, that makes a statement about it almost. And really, like, has a thematic element around it that doesn't just like well we're a police game and we're just going to ignore everything that's going on in the world around us would be kind of irresponsible i feel like so definitely that i think is required on some level again i don't really know what the thematic element would be it's it's kind of a complex thing to really wrap your head around definitely some more updated Scenes. So, like, Ready or Not did a really good job of this. They have, or are going to have, maybe. I don't know if I'm allowed to speak publicly about this. I suppose it's worth saying, but they were going to have a level where you uh, were essentially swatting somebody, and you're the SWAT officer in that situation, which I think is neat. There's scenarios like school shootings which are almost like blase here in america like they happen every year but like have it really shock you and really be like this is completely senseless and this shouldn't be happening again ready or not did a really good job of this with their uh nightclub level i i felt like anyway and just in general feeling more modern and and the kinds of narratives that are being talked about i think is very important Another thing I'd like to see is just better balance, you know. I shouldn't feel like I'm carrying the same kit into every single level because it works. I feel like there should be a reason why I need to take a lethal weapon besides the need to challenge myself. Again, that could have impacts on the story as well. Like, if I'm carrying a lethal weapon and I happen to shoot a suspect, like, will that come back to me? Will I be made to feel bad because I shot somebody, even though I could have chosen a less lethal option? Or, like, going the other way around, should a character come back and say something bad about me because I didn't shoot somebody that was holding them hostage? I think there's so much more that could be done with the genre of video game, if you want to call it a genre, that we're dealing with here. And SWAT 4 is good. It serves as a very good template of what that kind of game could be especially with the kinds of level design that it has very puzzle-ish fps if you want to call it that tactical would be another way to call it but i think it needs just a little bit of elevating beyond that i guess definitely in terms of plot and i think also as well as that you can interact with your other swat officers as well a little bit better so like having a little bit more character and personality behind them would be good we have four AI squad members in SWAT 4 that have a personality to them, but we don't really know, aside from like a little blurb in the menus, like anything about them. We don't know if they have children. We don't know if they have a wife. We don't know why they got into policing. 
we don't really know what they do for fun outside of policing. They don't really have a personality to them. They have a different voice actor, and that's about it. There's an old guy. He's an old guy. That's his trope. Reynolds. He's he's old. That's all you know about him is that he's old. And um, Jackson. He's the he's the black guy. So like that's his personality. Like they don't they they almost kind of feel like little cardboard cutout characters almost, and that's unfortunate and i'm sure i'm gonna get a lot of heat for that because it's like there's gonna be somebody who's like well actually fields is really this deep intricate character with moral quandaries on him or something i don't know but just the game doesn't portray that very well it's like they have a one-liner throwaway about like i took a girl on a date here once like okay i guess that's a personality but that's not who they are i guess I could have said that. I suppose we want to know that. I could have made a funny YouTube video and said that. (laughs) I always thought it was a light from a co-op session. Really, we want want to know the old guy character was just two days away from retirement, damn it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually funny. He's the funniest line, I think, from him is like, these kids in their video games. He literally says that in one of the missions. I totally agree that, especially in today's age, we need a good police story, which not only portrays the police in a good light, but also humanize the police officer and the, the, the trauma basically they get from this work. I think it's even more complicated than that because like there are good cops and bad cops. Like there are people who legitimately want to improve the world through police work. And there are also legitimately people who had no other choice and decided to be a police officer because their parents were a police officer. There's also people who legitimately get a rise out of having authority and who are police officers for that reason. Like, there are more interesting stories to be told about SWAT officers than that guy is a grumpy old guy or that guy is a black guy or that guy has a funny New York accent, you know? Definitely. I would love seeing a whole series of games like this. I would buy them all, especially if they have co-op. Yes, the, the co-op's the most important part for me, for sure. Oh, you're in good company there. <laughs> yeah, of course, I have to mention it. Direct IP, please. Yeah, just anything that will extend the lifespan of the game beyond the point where the developer, or sorry, the publisher usually, isn't it? Decide, now screw it, we can't be bothered anymore. It's no longer profitable, turn it off. One feature I would really like in a new game would be that you also have to escort civilians to a safe zone. Here you just say, well, he is there, get him. We have to collect all this important evidence because it's our job to do everything. But no, we don't escort those civilians into safety. Yeah, so that's actually one area that I think SWAT 4 kind of got a downgrade from SWAT 3 because in SWAT 3, you go through the mission and then behind you, there is an invisible force called trailers where you go through a mission and then suddenly you hear trailers and you'll come to discover that everybody behind you has been taken off of the map, which makes it, I guess, a little bit more realistic, but comes at the expense of maybe feeling maybe a little bit janky because just you go back and they're suddenly gone and there's not really like, you know, there's not really anything you could see about them being evacuated or anything like that. And I guess in SWAT 4 also kind of makes it a little bit more interesting Because you can have a suspect that runs back to a room that you already cleared and barricade themselves in it. I guess it makes the level design a little bit more interesting in that respect. But definitely having a part where you have more, I guess, like, I'm not exactly sure what the word is for it, but like having more of a story beyond like, I zip tied these guys together. And that story could be like, I took them off of the map, you know, that would give you a little bit more connection to the people that you're saving, I feel like. Also, it would be maybe interesting if the AI would kind of retake the hostages you already rescued or intercept you, work against basically in that sense also. Actually, the expansion kind of made this a little bit closer to this, so... When the game originally came out in 2005, if you yelled at 
a suspect and made them surrender and then just left them alone, they would not do anything at all. They would just be in the state where they're on their knees, essentially, and just being compliant all the time, which obviously isn't very realistic at all. You could just make everybody surrender and then zip tie them all up at the end. So the expansion made it so that like, if you or one of your AI officers isn't looking at them for long enough, then they'll take their gun and actually like run away or like try to fire at you again. In Elite Force, I took this one step further and actually if there's no weapon at all present, then they can just run away. That was one thing that I really liked about the expansion pack. And I think more dynamicism or more dynamic interactions with suspects like that are really important. Another one that I've sort of had in my brain for the longest time is like, what if there was a civilian that actually was a concealed carry person and they're waiting for the right moment to shoot at a suspect, for example. And again, SWAT 4 kind of does have this sort of thing. They have quote unquote suspects that immediately give up when you shout at them and they'll only fire at you if you don't announce that you are a police officer. That happens in the mission St. Michael's Medical Center. There's the bodyguards for the the diplomat. And again, Ready or Not kind of does this good as well because there's hiding spots for people to hide in, which was something that was in SWAT 3 too, by the way, that they took out of SWAT 4 was the hiding spots. Just more, more things to keep it interesting like that. Definitely. I'm on the same page as you. Or even just like cutting their buddies loose, you know? Like a suspect could go back into a room that you've already cleared and take, you know, take their zip cuffs off and give them a spare weapon or something like that. And giving you a reason to get them off of the map, I think, is important. Since you already talked so much about your mod, I would like finally to know where the inspiration came to do this and when this whole thing started for you. Yeah, so a little bit of an explanation of the timeline is required here. So I initially, and oh, I'm kind of I'm forgetting now how much of this I said before we started recording, but I started playing SWAT 4 when I was in, like, I really, I really got into it when I was in the eighth grade. And I would be up playing it until like four o'clock in the morning and just all of these things would bother me about like you know, this should really be that way. Or like, there's this rumor about tasing the elderly. Is it true? But it, it's not true. So yeah, I played it for a while, but I just kind of lost interest after a while. I didn't play it very consistently. I played it here and there. And actually, after I had worked on another mod called Jedi Knight Galaxies, I turned my attention towards SWAT 4 because I was just getting kind of burnt out on working on that mod. And I start playing it again and I was just really bothered by all of these different things, but I had a really hard time finding anything on the internet about how to mod this game. Like there was one guide about how to add a weapon and one guide on how to add a level to it. And that's basically it. And the software development kit, like I said, I, I knew to look for one because of experience with modding other games, but the, Software development kit itself is is kind of hard to come by until I unlo I, I actually found it and uploaded it on mod DB. So like the actual inspiration of it is like this thing is bothering me. Let's change this. Oh, this thing is bothering me. Let's change this. Like it started off being like the the whole tasing the elderly thing was like where I started off, right? Again, for background context here, like in the original game, like you can tase people basically as much as you want it does nothing you can you could tase them it doesn't even injure them it doesn't even deal health damage to them it just makes them more compliant there's not even really a downside to using the taser over the pepper spray even so i i fixed the problem where if you you tase an elderly person over and over again like it should cause some kind of damage to them right like they might have a pacemaker or something like that that seems pretty realistic and i started thinking more about like well what else would be realistic like For example, a big one kind of early on is you don't have a choice in terms of how much ammo you take with you. So I wanted there to be like at least an indication in terms of like how much ammo you could bring because 
like the P90, for instance, I think has one magazine in the original game. But if you take the ammo bandolier item, it takes two. But like, you don't know how much ammo you're taking with you. So like I added the ability for the equipment screen to actually show all of the stats for the weapon, including like real world information about like who manufactured it, when did it start being manufactured, where it was manufactured, like where did the weapon come from? Again, going back to being able to pick the number of magazines and stuff like that, a very obvious thing that I found early on when I was experimenting with this was like, well, there's not really a downside to just taking the maximum amount of ammo that you can bring. Like, there should be a compromise here. Like, you can either take a whole bunch of ammunition or something else. And what I found to be the best way of doing this was to break it up into a system of weight and a system of bulk. So weight is how heavy your equipment is. So obviously like you're carrying a bunch of boxes of rocks, like you're gonna be weighed down by that. And that has a pronounced effect on your ability to move. So if you're carrying a lot of really heavy items, then you're not gonna move as fast. That's also kind of a, a mechanic that's already existed in the game because if you're carrying light armor, then you go medium speed. If you're carrying heavy armor, then you go slow. And the expansion added no armor, which gives you no protection, but makes you the fastest. And also it increases how fast some of your interactions are, which takes me to our second addition here, which is the bulk feature. So weight measures how heavy your items are. Bulk is a measure of how big your items are. So if you're carrying a lot of very big items that are very light, actually what it impacts is your interaction speed with different things with the exception of handcuffing people due to technical reasons. So like if you're carrying a lot of really big items, then you're going to pick locks slower. You're going to put C2 on the door slower. You're going to switch weapons slower, that sort of thing. And I kept just adding stuff like stuff that bothered me, like no resolution options in the menu, like that bothered me. So I added that like things that bothered other people. I started adding that. I made a Discord server and advertised it as part of the mod and people started joining and telling me like, hey, this thing bothers me. Like, can you change that? And I was like, okay. I had this really good contributor. He's from Venezuela, Jose 21 Crisis, the madman. He actually compiled like all of the weights of all of the items in the game for me and all of the bulk of all of the items in the game for me. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, he did all of this work. Crazy, right? Like I haven't even heard from him in years because of the crazy situation over in Venezuela, actually. But he did a whole lot of legwork for me. And another person actually added in the iron sights feature because other games have the ability to aim down the sights, but SWAT 4 doesn't because it's kind of an older game. So somebody else added that in. And then somebody else went in and actually fixed the weapon models so that like because the game is old, it, it calls the side of the weapons that you can't see. But like, if you have iron sights, then you obviously have parts of the model that are missing. Yeah, it was just like a collection of just stuff that kept bothering other people and kept bothering me and like bugs that kept propping up. And I was just like, Ugh, I don't like this. And why are the missions organized in a really weird way? Like we should change up the mission so they're organized by difficulty level and don't have spikes everywhere and like why is there like a separate campaign for the expansion missions versus the non-expansion missions it should all just be like one campaign and like why can't i play custom maps in single player like why is that not a thing wouldn't it be cool if we added another campaign of stuff like just it kept just building honestly and pretty much right away i knew two things that i wanted the first is that this mod has to be completely open source because I'm not going to support this thing for forever. I'm not going to be around for forever. And it's becoming clear to me that the community wants like a lot of features and stuff like that. Like they have feature requests and bug fixes that they want implemented. And there was a lot of utility in other people submitting their fixes. And the second thing that became clear to me is that I don't want this to be a total conversion. I straight up do not want this to be a 
completely different experience from the original game. This needs to be SWAT 4 plus plus. It needs to be essentially the vanilla game with some extra features to it. I want it to feel like a second expansion pack without a second expansion pack's worth of content to it. And this point actually has been like a pain point for a lot of people who have been like, why don't you add like this modern day weapon? I, I don't know. I can't think of an example here, but like I specifically avoided adding weapons that were newer than would be indicated by the game's own timeline, which is 2008, I think. And I added um, unlocking stuff as well um, to make the gameplay more interesting. And just, like I said, it was very much just unplanned at first and just coalesced together very nicely. There was some planning put into specific features. For example, the weight and the bulk feature, like that sort of came at the same time as the magazine change feature like that. There was some planning there in my head and there is some foresight in some of the features that have come, but in by and large, it's been just kind of off the cuff making modifications. And I also really wonder how did you came up with the name Elite Force? I'm a big Star Trek fan and I played Star Trek Elite Force to death. So it's very strange for me, the name. It's actually funny because I think that's where the name came from, was that game. I thought it was a very nice tagline to it and it fit SWAT 4 perfectly. So I'm like, Elite Force, let's go for it. <laughs> that's nice. And actually, it's funny that you mentioned that because Raven actually made that game. Like, I, I loved Raven Software, the company, and yeah. I wanted to be QA on them for a period of time, but just wasn't in the cards. Yeah, I was a huge fan of Raven. They made some, some of my absolute favorite games. And then to see them sort of get absorbed and disappear and not be that anymore was kind of heartbreaking. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's really sad what they've become. A few quick questions also to your uh, amazing features you have included. For example, the traps. We encountered them. I also figured it out how to see them if you have the OptiWand. But can I really disable them from the other side or... Do you really have to go around and, yeah, disarm it from that side? Uh, yeah, you you really do have to go around to the other side. Okay. Because sometimes it's just an annoying alarm, but sometimes it's a bomb. <laughs> yeah. Traps are a pretty interesting story. Um, like, they were kind of a cut feature from the game. I actually didn't have to do a whole lot of work to put them in the game. I think I added a penalty for them being triggered, and I think I added maybe just like a little bit of code for them to spawn in, but they mostly just worked fine. Like, there was even commands to disable them and stuff like that that I just didn't have to do anything to. It just pretty much pop it in and it works. And if you're paying close enough attention to the original game, there's actually, like, references in the briefing and then the, like, stuff to traps actually in the game so it, it just seems like kind of a weird omission from the game honestly i imagine that they probably got rid of them because uh, i really don't know like maybe they didn't want to have jump scares in the game maybe <laughs> that's true it was a jump scare the first time we encountered them yeah i also at least i think i remember that in the original game you didn't have the the sniper view in co-op. It was only single player. Did you include that or was this already in the game and I just forgot? Uh, yeah, no, I added that to um, to multiplayer. And um, in the latest version, which sadly isn't played a whole lot, I think there's bugs or something like that. There's actually the ability to share your equipment with other people. Oh, nice. Yeah, you can hold a grenade and then you use the punch key and it will actually give that other person your grenade, which is helpful. And you can do that with the AI and single player as well. You can ask them for something and they'll give it to you. I also read that there is the option that you can give the squad commands, orders, by a kind of a voice over IP system. Yeah, so this is actually another cut feature from the game that strangely they just didn't finish or they didn't document or it was like 99% of the way there. It was just not finished. 
So actually what tipped me off to this was a mod called Speech Recognition Improvement, or SRI. It's made by a person called DK 19 I think. What he found is that if you add a file, I think it's called speech command grammar.xml to the system folder, and then you do some tweaking of the GUI files, you can actually add that feature back in. And what this feature is, is that or well, for more context here, the Stetchkov Syndicate added the ability for uh, voice over IP or communicating over mics. Unfortunately, the quality is really bad, but not the point. The point is, is that they added this ability to actually issue commands with your voice. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? No other game has that as far as I know. But you can be like, red team, clear this room, or red team, fall in. You just speak it and they, they do it, which is crazy. And it's not even using any kind of like, I, I guess what's sort of mind boggling is that they don't use like an online cloud kind of provider for it. Like they do speech recognition completely just through Microsoft speech API, which okay. isn't supported anymore. Actually, they in their infinite wisdom decided that you have to do Azure to do any kind of voice recognition now. So it's unclear as to whether this feature will be supported later due to just changes in Microsoft Windows. Sadly, I have to contradict you. Star Trek Bridge Commander also had this feature where you could order your bridge crew to do certain tasks. That, so that was an interesting one as well, because speaking about being tied into cloud services, that one ran on Watson. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't limited to specific commands. It had um, a quite intelligent method of passing what you were saying naturalistically. So you could literally just talk to it. It didn't always work 100% properly, but it was pretty impressive. I didn't know that. I never used it. I know that it was the feature and that it used uh, also kind of Microsoft technology in the background. Could that be true? Um, from what I read it and uh, from, from the documentation inside, it was, it was, it was Watson, which I think was an IBM um, oh, okay. thing. Um, but yeah, that's a completely sidetracking off. The that, definitely. So let's go <laughs> back uh, to, to your mod. I also read that there is the possibility, but it's very hard, many problems for you to include AI for co-op sessions, basically additional squad members. Uh, no, I didn't implement that. As far as I can tell, though, the main thing that's kind of holding it back is the ability for commands can't be replicated properly across the network. And it's really just a minor technical problem. I did look into it a while ago. I just didn't really test it all that much, but it is possible. I think I've actually seen YouTube videos of it before, but it's not sadly a feature that's incorporated into Elite Force. Um, I wanted to go back, actually, you were talking about that game, Bridge Crew, I think it was? No, no, not the bad one, the good one, Bridge Commander. Bridge Commander, Bridge yeah. Commander yes. So that actually kind of highlights one of the limitations of the speech recognition in SWAT Elite Force is that you have to give very specific commands and yeah. you have to do it in like a news prompter kind of style like you have to be red team do this and if you have any kind of an accent it's just awful but yeah were there any big features or even cut content you really wanted in your mod but it just didn't work yeah um i've always kind of pondered the idea of going back to elite force again and one of the things that was implemented by the first responders mod was ballistic shields and their implementation of it's actually pretty good sadly i just it, the art assets involved and like everything there i just didn't get a chance to do it i have collaborated with the mod author of that mod before he's actually given me some weapon models for elite force and some of the features of his mod are actually some ideas that i've had For example, he added a uh, flashlight, like a dedicated flashlight tactical item. And the special utility that it has over your weapon mounted flashlights is that it will actually highlight items on the ground for you and make it easier to spot evidence and stuff like that that needs to be picked up. That's one thing that I would like to add. Um, I mean, honestly, I've kind of taken all of the cut content and put it back in that exists as far as I know. I think maybe the only thing that I'm missing is the AI and multiplayer that you've already mentioned and supporting the 
the uh, player versus player modes. This, I feel like, has been the greatest injustice that I've done, is that I've taken those modes out. The reason why I took them out is because there are some structures inside of the code base that if you modify them, it will break the game. And unfortunately, I had to modify those structures to replace. So it's it's weird because like a structure, when I'm talking about it, it's a fixed number of bytes long. And there's certain fields within that structure that I can reuse and change and do different things with them. Like I might have taken like the VIP values and use them for something in co-op. I'm I'm honestly it's been such a long time that I don't remember, but there's technical reasons why I w- had to take those modes out for implementing some of the co-op features. But that being said, the guy who made the first responders mod actually found a way around that potentially very recently. So it's possible that I might like if I were to return to Elite Force to do those competitive modes. And honestly, adding new modes would be pretty interesting. One of the ones that I actually personally added to Ready or Not early on, and it's based on a SWAT 4 mode, um, I think, gosh, I now I feel bad because I don't remember the name of it. But essentially what it is is that it's kind of like freeze tag that like once you arrest somebody on the other team, then they're out of the game. And the goal is to arrest everybody on the other team. But the caveat there is that, like, you can free your own teammates with the multi-tool. So, like, you have to defend the people that are already arrested. And that just seems kind of like, yes, that's a very awesome mode that I think should be added to the game. And I'm pretty sure that there's a fan-made mode for that already. I think it might be called Arrest and Rescue. I don't remember. So I hear there is still a bright future for your mod. Still haven't given up on it. Yeah, I don't know. It's really hard these days. I'm not going to lie to you. My life has changed a lot in the past four, five years. Even just when I was working on Ready or Not, like there were a lot of changes in my life that made working on mods or even just really having time for myself to be very difficult and kind of a bit of a challenge, honestly. I would like to try and come back to it at some point eventually. If anything, just to finish off those bugs that are making it so people won't play 7.2. Because it's like, you know, it's really cool to be able to share your equipment with other people. And I think that's a really nice feature to have. It's just you don't see it in multiplayer because people don't use the latest version because of the bugs. And I want to patch out those bugs eventually. And I would really like to maybe collaborate again with the first responders mod developer and tweak his mod a little bit more and just play around a little bit more but there's also a question of like well also ready or not exists and does that kind of like make it moot because there's already a modern replacement i don't know if you'd even call it a replacement just i don't know there's a lot of factors that go into it i don't want to say that the mod's abandoned because it's not really like i have even played it pretty recently i would say within the past six months i've played it but I just straight up honestly don't have the time anymore to work on it. When I started working on it, I was in college. I had a lot of time to work on it. And around 2019, some personal stuff happened. I am dedicating a lot of time to like just my family in general. I, I don't have a lot of time to do mods anymore. And... Like I've even like I've even taken on some contract work as well, game contract work for a little bit of extra income. Unfortunately, it's under NDA, so I, I can't talk about it, but it's nothing to do with even SWAT, but just like I've had not a lot of time to do anything really, unfortunately. I think the most that I've done with gaming is like I've played some with my 11 year old son. There's actually a game on Switch called uh, Super Animal Royale, I think is what it's called. It's like a, it's kind of like Fortnite, but you're like little animals that shoot each other. It's funny. And uh, Splatoon, I played some of that with him. But uh, I haven't done a whole lot of game development stuff. I did, 
I worked on an indie game actually that's sort of emblematic of the kinds of struggles that you deal with when you're dealing with depression. Although I wasn't quite as on the nose about it as say Zoe Quinn with Depression Quest, but unfortunately I lost all the files to that due to a hard drive failure. So that kind of sucks. Ouch. Um, yeah, but a simple little game. I could probably put it back together in a couple of weeks. So I'm not too torn up about it, but yeah, I, I don't want to say that I'm done working on the mod because there's still stuff I'd like to add. It's just realistically, I don't have a ton of time to do it lately. And I'd like to be able to show my kids the stuff that I've done even, but just th they're not even old enough for it yet. You know, like trying to tell my two year old that a cult of crazy people are going to blow up their neighborhood. You know, it's a little. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's rough. It, well, yeah. you're speaking to a very receptive audience here. Both of us um, entirely understand the concept of life getting in the way of living. Yeah, we know. I'm not going to lie. It was kind of a shock because I went from like basically living on my own to having four kids in the span of like two years. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's intense. <laughs> well, then, thank you very much for joining us. It was really a pleasure talking to you. Normally, I would also talk about hidden content and special memories, but we are already over two hours, 30. Yeah. So I think we cut this. It's not so much loss. There is just a few things for hidden content and yeah, special memories we can share online in different ways. But what I want to give you is, of course, the opportunity to open the mic to you. Is there anything you would like to add, anything which is still on your mind? This whole time, I've been asking myself if there's anything more that I wanted to say at the end, but like, I've been very blessed to have a lot of success in the kinds of mods that I've done. And I have learned a whole lot about not just game development, not just mod development, not just internal stuff, because I've been doing mod development since I was in middle school, basically but also a lot about human behavior and a lot about game design and a lot about community management and doing all of that stuff has made me really oblivious to life itself and about my own feelings and about my own mental health and about just all of the other aspects of life because I was just so hyper-focused on making mods and making games and fostering a community. I was just so focused on that sort of stuff that I didn't really even think about taking care of other people and like I definitely regret before Elite Force really honestly because I feel like in Elite Force I was very calm and collected by then but I feel like I was just kind of a dick to people a lot I think just these last couple of years have been very eye-opening for me in a lot of respects And there's so much more to life than your creative outlets and your pursuits and endeavors. And like you look at a Wikipedia page and you see just all of the stuff that they've accomplished, but that doesn't really tell you the whole story. I actually read, surprisingly, I read a book, right? I, I read a uh, memoir by uh, the Iron Maiden lead singer, Bruce Dickinson. And He writes all about all the stuff that he's done. He's written about all the tours that he's been on, all the crazy antics behind the songs. And then at the very end of the book, he writes a little paragraph about, ah, if I didn't mention my kids or my family or anything like that, then this book would be three times as long. So I'm just not going to do it. I think that's fascinating to me because I was very heavily invested in that kind of behavior of, making a reputation for myself and just i had such a strong ego about myself that i just really hate honestly looking back it's kind of cringy but yeah i don't know if there's more that i would add honestly uh, i'm sure there's people that are following me want me to shout out them uh i hope jose 21 crisis is doing okay uh he's in venezuela and i have not heard from him in several years now There's other supporters like Sandman332, really appreciate the support, and uh, Mezzo Coco and Kevin Foley and the other people who have contributed over the years. I just want to shout out to them. Well, 
if it is the case, Easy, that um, you used to be a bit of a dick, <clears throat> congratulations on turning that around, because you certainly give the impression now of being someone who's very cognizant of yourself. <clears throat> Sorry, of yourself and your uh, your interactions with others. So nicely done on that score. Yeah, definitely yours for me. You did an amazing job there. Kids and time change everybody, I would say. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like I said, going from none to four and kinds of stuff that I've just been experiencing lately has been kind of intense. So um, I guess I just never really appreciated the amount of effort that it takes to actually raising children. Like nobody tells you about that. It just kind of sneaks up on you. Yeah, the advertisement is always different. But I would say we close it off here. Thank you, thank you for joining us. It was really amazing talking to you. And yeah, of course, thanks for the amazing work you did. We really enjoyed your mod today and we will try it in the future many times, I guess. Absolutely. Sure, yeah. And if you'd like to set up a game sometime, maybe we can do that. Of course, well, it might be a little tricky. Great, yeah. yeah. Make a developer playthrough. Definitely would like that. But for now, that's it for this review. Leave us a comment, tell us what you think about the game and of course, play the game. Until next time.